Hey, it's me. You know we all have more than just our physical bodies. We also have different subtle bodies, each representing various aspects of ourselves. Our thoughts create definite spiritual forms, and so do our feelings. In a way, a feeling is like a thought that hasn't been fully formed yet. Both thoughts and feelings create substantial forms in the spiritual world. Each of these subtle bodies, as well as our physical body, has an aura, a kind of energy or vibration that comes from it. The forms created by our thoughts and feelings are reflected in these auras. These forms really exist in the spirit realm. The auras aren't the images themselves, but rather reflections of them. Depending on how intense our thoughts or feelings are, these forms can be vague and weak or strong and lasting. Everything in the spirit world is always moving and changing. The aura of our physical body shows our physical health or sickness in other physical conditions. Our emotional, intellectual, or spiritual reactions show up in the auras of our respective subtle bodies. Every living being has a higher self or divine spark. This is the finest and brightest of our subtle bodies vibrating at the highest frequency. The higher our spiritual development, the faster this vibration. Over time, since the fall of the angels, our higher self has gradually been surrounded by layers of denser matter. Not as dense as our physical body, but much denser than the higher self. This is how the lower self came into existence. These layers are made of subtle matter that we can't see with our physical eyes. The goal of spiritual development is to eliminate the lower self so that the higher self can be free again from all the outer layers it has acquired. In our own lives, we can often sense that certain parts of our higher self are already free, while other parts are still hidden. How much is free or hidden depends on our overall development. The lower self isn't just about common faults and individual weaknesses. It also includes ignorance and laziness. It resists change and hates the idea of conquering itself. It has a strong will that might not always show on the outside and wants its own way without paying the price. It's proud and selfish, often full of personal vanity. This is the ego in all its forms. These traits are generally part of the lower self, no matter what other individual fault the person might have. There are many ways the lower self can show these general tendencies. How it appears depends on different factors, like personal faults, that can affect these common traits differently. The qualities of the higher self and other circumstances also influence how these tendencies show up, their intensity, degree, and direction. We can see both the higher self and the lower self. However, not all spirits can see all the subtle bodies of a being. Only those who have reached a certain level of development can. Just because a spirit has left its physical body doesn't mean it could see more than any of us. A spirit at a higher level can not only interpret the lower self, but can also see through it to discover the higher self in all its splendor. Physical matter doesn't block their spiritual sight and perception, so they can tell which thought forms come from the higher self and which from the lower self. They can also see when the wishes and efforts of the higher self are mixed with tendencies from the lower self, twisting or tainting the original intention. When messages from the higher self are tainted with motives from the lower self, it creates a disorder in the soul that makes the person emotionally unwell. These different tendencies have various colors and sometimes different sounds and scents. For example, someone might want something selfishly, but doesn't want to admit its selfishness. They start to rationalize their desire and fool themselves about it. We can see this clearly, and this kind of self-deception is very common, right? The forms of the higher self have a completely different character than those of the lower self. Now, there's another layer that people don't recognize enough for its full importance, and we'll call it the mask self. The mask self is created when you realize 
that giving in to your lower self might cause conflict with those around you, but you're not ready to pay the price to eliminate the lower self. Facing it as it is really, with all its motives and drives, would mean taking the difficult spiritual path. Many people don't want to think that deeply. They react emotionally without facing the lower self. So the subconscious feels the need to present a different picture to avoid difficulties or unpleasantness. People create another layer of the self that has nothing to do with reality, neither with the higher self nor the temporary reality of the lower self. It's phony or false. It's unreal. All right, so let's go back to that example for a moment. The lower self tells someone to be ruthless about a selfish desire, let's say. Anyone can see that giving in to this desire might make others dislike them, right? No, something nobody wants. So instead of overcoming selfishness through slow development, people often act as if they're already unselfish, but they actually feel selfish. They dislike the pressure from their higher self to act against their lower self's desires and feel compelled to put on an act. This disturbs their inner peace because it doesn't match their still dominant lower self feelings. Their giving and generosity are just a facade. In other words, the right action isn't supported by purified feelings, so the person is conflicted inside. The proper action becomes something they feel forced to do, not a free choice. Such forced goodness doesn't count in the real sense. You might give something, but hate the idea. People remain convinced they need to be selfish, but are also untrue to their nature, violating the reality and living a lie. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's okay to give in to your lower nature. That's not what I'm saying. We absolutely must strive for enlightenment and work to purify our feelings and desires. But if we haven't achieved that yet, we should at least not deceive ourselves. We should have a clear and true picture of the gap between our feelings and actions. In this way, no mask self can form. Because too often, and I've done this myself many, many times, people try to believe their own unselfishness and fool themselves about their real feelings and motives by not showing them or not wanting to look at them. Over time, this negativity sinks into the subconscious where it ferments and creates forms that have an effect but can't be eliminated because the person isn't aware of them. The example of selfishness is just one example, right? Many other traits and tendencies go through the same process. When people are emotionally unwell, it's always a sign that in some way, in some way, a mask self has been created. They don't realize they're living a lie. They built a layer of unreality that has nothing to do with their true being, their dishonoring their soul. As I said before, being true to yourself doesn't mean giving in to your lower self, but rather being aware of it. Don't fool yourself if you're still acting out of a need to protect yourself rather than from enlightened vision and inner conviction. Be aware that your feelings are still unpurified in certain respects. Then you have a good starting point, at least. It's going to be easier to face yourself this way when you realize that beneath the layers of your lower self lies your higher self, your ultimate and absolute reality that you will eventually reach. To get there, you must first face your lower self, your temporary reality, instead of covering it up because that puts an even greater distance be between you and your higher self when you cover it up. To face the lower self, you must, at all cost, tear down the mask self. And we can do that when we visualize the three selves that we're talking about. Lying to yourself and not thinking about your emotions and true motives at all, but just letting your emotions react without thinking might seem okay at times, but it's not. If you want to be, ha be happy, healthy, and at peace inside and truly fulfill your life and be in harmony with God and your inner self, you need to find the answers to these questions once and for all. What is the real me? What is my higher self? 
what is my lower self? Where might be a mask, that mask self of falsehood? Many people wear a mask, at least in some ways. This mask self presents to us a very unattractive color, right? For those that can see aura. It's not dark or sinister like the trends of the lower self. The colors of the mask are often sickeningly sweet. It's like, you know, if, if you're an artist or you have an artistic sense, you probably have an even better ability than, you know, what I'm talking about to know how to tell the difference between like good, genuine color and unreal, overly sweet ones. The word itch comes to mind as a good descriptor here. It's the same with the tones and the smell of the mask self. Like they're sickeningly sweet and nauseating. Um, the emanations and effects of the lower self, unpleasant as they may be, are often easier to take because at least they're honest. They are what they are. It's important for all of us to try to train our inner eye to see ourselves and others from this perspective. The more spiritually awake you become, the easier it it is to accurately perceive yourself and others. When you come into contact with the higher self, once your intuition has awakened through your personal spiritual development, you'll feel a distinct difference, a distinct difference between the mask and the higher self. You'll sense the unsettling manifestations of the mask in yourself first, no matter how pleasant the mask may seem. That usually comes first. So if you want to walk this path and heal from emotional struggles, I really believe it's important to understand this. Even if you're not what people call neurotic and they're only like minor deviations, so to speak, within you, it's still useful to understand and reflect on all this. I think it also can explain why often someone undergoing therapy with a psychiatrist, a doctor, you know, similar practitioner, who strictly follows a school of thought that doesn't acknowledge any spiritual truth and who isn't very intuitive about such things, like intuition is not brought in the equation, can plunge into a crisis where their state of mind becomes worse than, say, before they started treatment. Of course, there are many, many doctors with good intuition, many, many practitioners and healers with good intuition and a strong sense of guidance, in which case that undesirable outcome may not happen at all, or if it does, it doesn't happen as severely. But when the mask has been torn down and that individual is confronted with the lower self, the experience can be shattering so shattering that they might break down completely, like leave therapy and suffer even more serious consequences. On the other hand, if that person were told what we're talking about here, and prepared for what to expect, that tragedy, that hardship likely could be avoided. If a patient knew that they had to face the lower self, which exists in every human being, and also knew that this lower self, unpleasant as it may be, is not their ultimate I or true self, and that the higher self, which is perfection, waiting to emerge from those layers of imperfection, is their true self, then that shock wouldn't occur. Like, imagine what that knowledge could do in the right hands, in the hands of right practitioners, healers, doctors, psychiatrists, parents, and teachers. So I hope that resonated with you on some level. Love you. Let's connect soon.